the comprehensive plan. And now we are recording, so we have this uh, for reference in the future. Um, before we get going, I think it'd be valuable just for all of us to uh, go around the table here um, and just introduce yourselves and uh, uh, what your background is or where you're coming from. And then we'll introduce, uh, we'll do introductions for those joining us on Zoom. So again, Carlos Espinosa, city planner. Jerome Christensen, uh, gentleman at leisure, <laughs> formerly uh, editor at the Daily News. Ethan Wilkins, I work at Fastenal and relatively new here, uh, two years now in Winona. Uh, Scott Moxtonix, I teach at Winona State University. This is my fourth year in Winona. Uh, Chad Ubel, city manager. Lucy McMartin, uh, community development. Lydia Boyson, citizen of Winona. Nancy Denzer, retired educator and also serve on the school board uh, for the district. My name is Luke Sims. I'm going to be helping facilitate this meeting here today. I'm one of the city planners for the city of Winona and I will go ahead and call on Jim to go ahead and introduce yourself first. Uh, Jim Goblish, I'm the head of facilities at Winona State. Jessica. Hello, Jessica Remington, Associate Vice President of Business Development at Winona Health and I have been in Winona for eight years now. Chris. I am Chris Stout. I'm a history instructor at Minnesota State College Southeast. I'm also the legislative liaison and I sit on our shared governance committee. So I've been at Southeast for 15 years. And other Chris Rogers, if you'd like to say hi from the media desk. Hi, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm the editor of the Winona Post. Uh, I'm not on the committee, but we're uh, observing and following along and writing some stories about the comp plan process. And Sadie, you can go ahead and say hi too as an observer. Hello, my name is Sadie. I am on the steering committee in the Accessible Government Subcommittee, and I am just here to listen in. All right, and with that, I think that we can begin. Again, thank you everybody for coming. We'll start off with a subcommittee summary. Um, and this summary, uh, we'll pass it out for those that are here, and then we'll also put it on Zoom for those of us uh, who are joining uh, via Zoom here. And I'm just going to share my screen. And this uh, subcommittee framework you've uh, seen before when uh, you were signing up for the uh, subcommittee that we're here today for, um, but this is kind of a latest and greatest uh, summary of what we'll be looking at for the next few months here. Um, transformative projects. This is a new uh, section for the comprehensive plan. Our existing 2007 comprehensive plan does not have this section in it, um, but we wanted to add it because we thought that it was a good way for us to talk about some of the big projects uh, that are out there and big projects that may come up and we don't want to, for instance, if a certain project comes up, have the whole section of, a of the plan uh, just talking about that project. And if that project doesn't happen, then you have a whole section of the plan that was dedicated to that project. And what we really wanna do is try to back away a little bit, look at things from a 30,000 foot viewpoint and um, be able to uh, kind, of, kind of consolidate those larger projects into uh, this group. And so that's why it was created. Um, it was based off of uh, some recent planning work that the city of Duluth did. And I provided that document in the notification for the meeting today. And we'll go over that in just a few minutes here. Um, but really I thought it was a valuable way for the city of Duluth to uh, establish future projects that have been in discussion for a long time and note in their plans uh, what type of partnerships would be needed to potentially move those projects forward and then what other considerations uh, might be for those projects whether or not they actually occur or not um, just to have that um, encapsulated in a comprehensive plan i think is tremendously valuable uh, for everybody in our community so that being said um, the definition of our uh, subcommittee here in terms of transformative projects are future projects that build new or change existing things, which will influence how Winona grows and develops. In accordance, transformative projects detailed in the plan should have the following characteristics, number one through four, um, be a physical improvement. So we're talking about like a, a physical change to the city landscape versus uh, maybe 
taking a look at a social issue or something like that. So that's really what we're focusing on is a physical improvement. We're also talking about uh, new construction or a new use um, versus vacation of an existing building or a, a building that's going to be vacant. Um, what we want to focus on is a project that is proposed for a new reuse of that building or um, a new type of thing coming into a specific area. Number three, and I really think this is kind of the key, uh, is that it, the project should be in a conceptual phase. Um, so identified in a publicly available plan or planning documents, um, but not currently in design or construction. So there's a couple of examples that I have um, following number four there. Um, but just briefly, uh, the project should also have uh, impacts beyond the project itself and the immediate surrounding area. So it truly is a transformative uh, project. So some examples of transformative projects for the comp plan, um, the police fire community center uh, project, which is uh, in a concept form, but has not uh, entered that uh, design phase. It's still in a concept and discussion phase. The second is uh, something that was brought up a number of years ago, um, but I know is in the planning uh, for uh, WSU and that's been the uh, field house um, located just off of Sarnia Street there. Um, lake park improvements. So uh, a number of improvements to the lake park area. Um, recently, uh, there was a, a discussion about a ball field, potentially a baseball field in that area. Um, so those are just kind of some examples of transformative projects that have been identified they're in public plans, um, but they're not in the design phase yet. Um, in contrast, there are other transformative projects that I think it's pretty easy to identify them as uh, transformative, but they're in that design phase right now. So what we want to do is leave those off since this is uh, more of a forward planning document versus a construction document. And these projects such as 60 Main and the Masterpiece Hall project are in the design phase right now. So they'll, they'll be going through the public approval process um, relatively uh, soon here. So um, 60 Main uh, is a project, uh, mixed use, um, close to the riverfront uh, behind the movie theater. Um, and so, um, you know, the status of that continues to, to change and, um, you know, we're not sure when and, and what the timeline is on that. But again, it's in the design phase and just starting in preliminary uh, right now. So uh, that's an example of one that at this point um, we wouldn't touch with this committee. The other one would be the Masterpiece Hall that was recently announced um, that we think will um, have a transformational impact on the downtown area. Uh, but again, it's in that design phase. Um, so just to help provide kind of a little context of what we're taking a look at or what we intend to take a look at uh, with transformative projects. And so what we uh, are looking at here is a meeting schedule um, throughout the next three months in May. We have our first meeting right now, it's beginning of May. We'll also take a look at a second meeting in May and then uh, additional meetings in June, July and August. And as I noted in the uh, email that went out for uh, this meeting today, what we're going to try and do is create a big list of transformative projects that meet the criteria that we just talked about, uh, and then try and narrow that down to five top projects today. And we have an exercise with Menti online so that we'll be able to do it um, not only with those that are here, but also those that are joining us via Zoom. And so as long as you have a smartphone or if you are in front of a computer, you can participate in that. And I'm seeing nods. So I think everybody has that. So, all right, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump into that in a little bit here. But so after identifying those top five projects um, today, uh, what we'd be looking at doing is addressing one of those projects at each uh, meeting moving forward here. So end of May, June, and then in July, moving forward to August, and by the end of August, having a presentation to the steering committee. So what this subcommittee will be doing is putting together a recommend, recommended chapter on the transformative projects. And that'll go to the steering committee um, and then to planning commission and city council and be included in, as part of the first draft of the comprehensive plan that we'll be looking at um, reviewing this fall. Then we'll have a second draft of the plan that'll also get reviewed and we're looking at adoption first half of 2023. So in terms of subcommittee meeting process and products, so starting 
Jessica, it looks like you have a question if you want to go ahead and jump All right, in. Yeah, just a quick question so I understand um, the definition. So when you're defining transformative projects, I see you said the newer, the newer change existing things which influence how Winona grows or de develops. What, like, if you were to measure what success looks like, like, how would you know that you achieved it? Is it like more tourism? Is it, is it, what does it look like? What it looks like is having uh, impacts beyond just the project site itself. Um, so you're having uh, projects beyond the people that are just being served by that project. So you're not just impacting the immediate neighborhood or the people that are uh, living in that area, but it has impacts beyond that as well. And that could impact um, the surrounding number of blocks or it could impact the entire community. So we're really looking at those big projects that'll have um, a significant impact on the future development of the city. Does that help? Yeah, a little vague, but I'm, I'm cool with vague. Thank you. Just to, add, just to add to that, Jessica, what we're going to be talking about as soon as we dive into the Duluth portion as well is that this committee's goal is to really figure out what those considerations are. So it's not so much measuring success like we want this project to be successful, but how can that project best address negative externalities or uh, the po better facilitate positive outcomes? Uh, what, what types of things need to be addressed? And here, Carlos has already pulled it up for the meeting process and product. You know, why is this needed? Um, what is needed? And you know, how is it going to benefit the overall community? We want to lay out this doc, or this portion of the comprehensive plan in a manner so that people reading it can go, oh, great, these are phenomenal considerations that need to be addressed as this project moves forward in four years or five years or 10 years. Um, and it's a way for us to kind of keep ourselves, both as elected officials, appointed officials, and staff pointed in the right direction as these projects come up. Oftentimes, there's a lot of waiting and then a whole bunch of activity in one, one or two moments or in government a few months. And, uh, and we all really want to get a project through, but we need to make sure that the, these transformative projects are actually hitting all of the right considerations. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, we'll just continue here with the subcommittee uh, process and product. And so what we'd be looking at for uh, each meeting after this meeting would be to have somebody or a, a couple of people uh, talk about the project and answer the questions that are shown on the screen and really help to provide that um, background on the project and establish why it is part of a publicly available planning document or why it is part of a um, uh, planning document for an institution or business. And then given that presentation, the intent would be that the subcommittee would uh, discuss important considerations as Luke mentioned for uh, future project implementation. So if the project is implemented, what are some things that really need to be uh, focused on? And that's what we put on the, in the comprehensive plan so that when these projects, if and when these projects would come forward, we can look to the comprehensive plan and say, hey, you know what? We um, took a look at this and there are some important things that we need to make sure that we hit on when uh, the project is being presented for uh, potential uh, implementation. So really that's what we're uh, looking to do here. And then in addition to that, staff would create a list of project partners. So um, if we're taking a look at a, a large project, there's gonna be a, a lot of different uh, uh, groups and organizations most likely involved. And uh, we would help to populate that section. And so the product for each project would be a, pro a project rationale, give some background on it, uh, the partners, and then the considerations for implementation. And that's what would be um, written into the comprehensive plan. So go ahead. Having these projects up in their, their work too, that could Definitely. So what we wanted to do is to start with the five top projects from that we were generated in this within this committee. But if other projects come up, what we would do is bring them to this committee and maybe we'd have to add a meeting or two um, or something like that. But um, what we wanted to do is start with this committee. And then if other project comes up, comes up through the process, add them as appropriate. Any other questions at this point? I think Cindy had one in chat. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, it, it's okay. Uh, that it's a little bit clearer to me now. I was just wondering if today you were all talking about projects, but 
it seems now that everyone who's on the committee has already submitted a proposal for a project and you'll be discussing them. Nope, not yet. We will be oh. uh, populating a mentee uh, survey in just a few minutes here. Um, but we did ask uh, for people to, um, and those who are on the committee, we asked in the uh, email to be thinking about some potential projects given the parameters that we discussed, so. Okay, um, before we get into that, one other additional piece of information that I wanted to share as well, and at least go over a little bit, um, was the information that uh, we provided from the uh, city of Duluth. And so let me just pull that up here and I can hand that out as well. So you have a paper copy. And I'll just note that all of the uh, documents that we're taking a look at here will be listed on the city's website in the subcommittee reference uh, section. And we'll send out a link so you know exactly where that's at. But it'll have everything having to do with the transformative uh, project subcommittee um, in that uh, area of the website. So you'll be able to access that online as needed. And we'll also have uh, copies of uh, the meeting materials at City Hall. So if you need something and you know you, you don't have, want to print it all off at home, just come into City Hall and uh, talk to Luke or I and we can get it for you, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is the document uh, that I sent out with the uh, meeting invitation, uh, the second one. And this is the section from Duluth that I referenced before. And you can see, uh, it's labeled something a little bit different, transformative opportunities versus transformative projects. Um, and really what they do is they explore new ideas that uh, continue to transform uh, the city of Duluth. And they establish some background and some parameters uh, such as what we just uh, went through. And they also talk about how the ideas in this chapter are opportunities to build or change things that'll influence how our city grows and develops. And so that's kind of what we'd be looking to do along the same lines uh, with this subcommittee. Then they move into uh, some core investment areas. And this is something that I, you know, I'm not sure how applicable that this would be to kind of the framework that we've put out so far, but you can see how they identify these core investment areas and then they identify actions. And so instead of actions, um, what we would be looking to do is uh, identify considerations uh, for the project uh, moving forward. So here's a good example where they talk about a downtown plan and investments uh, that provide a project rationale They move into partners. And then finally, they have implementation actions. And so, again, those actions would be considerations uh, in our plan. And so, really, you know, what we're looking to do through this process is not necessarily give um, these transformative projects that we identify a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's really not the role or intent of this committee. Um, nor is it to speak to the opinions of uh, any public official or you know, any public uh, person or public group. The intent is to take a look at uh, projects that have been defined uh, by institutions or by businesses and really try to get at what and what we should consider uh, if these projects do indeed uh, move forward and if they come to uh, fruition. And so, that's what this document does. Um, and we'd be looking to do uh, the same type of general thing um, with our document as well. And so they have more than five projects in here. Uh, our intent too would be at the end to be able to add in some additional um, projects as well. So you can see here right at the end of the document are uh, other projects that came up. There's a little bit of background on them. 
but they don't necessarily focus on them. So we would limit the, uh, just due to time constraints, uh, how much we can focus on the number of projects. Um, you know, I'm thinking at least five, maybe a couple more. Uh, but then if other ones come up that either we don't rank or don't bubble up to the top, um, or that we wanna make sure are in the comprehensive plan, but we don't focus on, uh, we can list them at the end of the document. So that would be the intent to at least have it there. So we, we know that that was something that was on uh, people's mind uh, at this time. So, all right, that's all I have for a, a presentation. Um, before we move into our next um, section, which would be that activity and listing transformational projects, um, are there any questions? Okay, so what I am going to bring up on the screen is a Mentimeter or a Menti uh, poll. And so what you would, you would do is go to www.menti.com and type in a project code. And I will bring that up on the screen here for everybody. M-E-N-T-I. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, and you can see once you go to menti.com and enter the code 17448925, that will bring you to this slide. And I will open up uh, the voting or the ability to type something in in just a few seconds here. So what you do is just type in the projects and um, we'll spend a good uh, few minutes here letting people populate this. And what we'll do is then we'll freeze it and capture it um, and take it from there. Um, so what I'll do is open it up and we should be good to go. So go ahead and add uh, projects that you think um, may meet the definition of the transformative projects. Again, just reference that subcommittee framework um, and the bullet points that we just talked about. So physical improvements, new construction or a new use, be in the conceptual phase versus design and then have impacts beyond the project itself and or the immediate uh, surrounding area. Yes, please. And Lydia's question was, do we want each one to be the, its own submission? And yes, please. So it would be uh, the second part. The, so Sadie's question is, are there plans for a community wide, wide call for ideas or will committee members be asked to serve as a community liaison and consult their communities for ideas others may have? And really what we wanna do is filter it through the subcommittees and the members of the subcommittees for a comprehensive plan. So um, the, the second uh, question is uh, the way we'd like to approach it. Carlos, on my screen, it says voting is closed. Jim, are you able to try refreshing that just to see if it's an issue with that? And if not, I am happy to type in answers as we go. No, that, that happened, but it erased what I had just typed, but that's okay. Okay, so it looks like it's working uh, now for people. Perfect.
Okay, and we'll leave it open for uh, one more minute here. I still see people typing, so. I need longer than a minute. Can we have a couple more minutes, sorry. Sure, you can have a couple more minutes, no problem. Okay, now we'll go to 30 seconds left. Pressure's on. Yes. So the question was, are all of these going to be captured? And yes, we are going to walk through a PDF with all of you right afterward. We're just going to export it and have a discussion moment. And then we are going to pull you for responses to see you know, what kind of rises to the top after that discussion. Uh, what, what do we see as kind of those first five that we need to start to begin to tackle? What can we begin to work on in our upcoming meetings? And um, I am frantically writing down what you all just wrote. So hopefully we will be able to have a very clean poll with completely well-spelled words. <laughs> Three, two. One, Jerome, are you still typing?
Okay. okay. <laughs> I just wanted to check. <laughs> All right. That works too. Okay. All right. Yep. Perfect. All right. And We get that doc as we get that document prepped here. Um, I do want to note that for those of us who are in the room right now, we do have microphones available in front of you. We don't have one for every single person, but we do ask that as we enter into this conversational phase, this discussion phase, please go ahead and grab that microphone and use it so that our friends on Zoom can also hear us talking. Um, these microphones do need to be fairly close to your face, so just be aware of that as you do uh, do speak into them. We do have a mic closer pink sign that we will hold up just in case you are not complying. And we'll have that up for everybody in about 30 seconds here. I'm going to start my timer and give myself the same thing that I just gave to you. So. Yep. All right, so um, we, as you can see, we have five slides. Thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, ideas and um, the ideas that uh, populated all five slides. So what we want to do is talk about the uh, ideas that came up on this slide here and uh, just have a general conversation about them related to those um, kind of criteria that we took a look at. So physical improvements involving new construction, conceptual phase, uh, and then having impacts uh, beyond the project itself and or the immediate area. Um, so I'll give um, those here uh, and those participating some time to take a look at this and go ahead and chime in um, if you wanted to uh, discuss one or more of those projects. And I will ask um, whomever uh, added the Biodome Winter Garden cons Conservatory, I'm wondering if you can give us some more information on that one. I noticed it was in the Duluth one as a, um, they call it a winter arboretum or something like that. And essentially having a space that can be used year round, but especially in the cold months. Um, I think it ties in a little bit to the public mental health as well, just having having an indoor space for people to use. Um, what are you specifically interested in or like where did the idea come from or? I just was looking for a little bit more information. Yeah. So, so that'll help. Um, what Luke is doing right now is populating our list of uh, projects essentially. Yep. And so what I would, um, what we could do then is if that is kind of what your intent is mm -hmm. um, in terms of a winter space indoor where you could have mm -hmm. uh, things related to mental health mm -hmm. and uh, you know a tree dome or not a tree dome <laughs> tree dome uh, biodome or winter garden or conservancy um, we could 
consolidate that into one project, mm -hmm. that project being a, a winter space yep. uh, for people. Even tying in public meeting spaces. Um, yeah, there could be room for a lot of things being bundled into that. Uh, I think about indoor spaces a lot in the winter. Definitely. It, you know, I would add that convention center might be a great opportunity to, you know, combine an effort to bring people into the community, but also into a beautiful space that can be utilized all, all year long. And um, convention center would really be an attractive facility for Winona. Um, we have so many things to look, you know, look at in this community, and um, people will come. I think if we build it. Definitely, and, and this is exactly what we're looking to do with each one of these slides, just have a little bit of discussion and are there things we can fold into one um, just to help uh, with the decision-making process. To follow up on that brief discussion, are we comfortable, based on what we're hearing, kind of combining the Biodome Winter Garden Conservatory into a convention center slash indoor winter space idea? I would like to add that the um, WSU Fieldhouse Convention Center and some of the needs of uh, Southeast, there, there's common program items in, among those that there could be a, and even the Winter Garden, there could be one big project that provides large scale gathering space that is, serves multiple needs. Jim, that's a really good follow up. As we are discussing conceptualized projects, are you suggesting that the WSU Fieldhouse project might be something that could incorporate additional um, community needs aside from just serving as a field house? Or would you like to flesh yeah. that out a little bit? Yeah, if with um, additional community participation uh, that would involve some land acquisition and additional funding, there's no reason why that couldn't become a community resource and not just dedicated to WSU athletics. You know, there, there's WSU can fund a part of it, which would be the athletics part, but there's no reason why it couldn't be a joint project and become something more. And it won't be used 24 seven by WSU. There'd always be time to schedule other things in it. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and Chris, uh, you raised your hand. Yeah, I had my hand up just to say that um, I'm on the comprehensive facilities plan that we're making for Southeast and <clears throat> we have a, a few things that are highly valuable, which is a lot of parking and some land. And so anything that can serve our students moving forward um, that we can incorporate with the community with WSU are all things that that we're interested in doing to help serve our students. And like you said, we can, you know, use it part of the time and the community can use it part of the time. WSU can use it part of the time. But um, so those are sort of two resources that that Southeast has to offer to many of these plans if they're if they can be used for our students as well. Chris, just to seek further clarification on that facilities plan, can you maybe specify that that is already a project in a conceptual phase that is beginning, right? And so, so we would be expanding on that, correct? Can you so, clarify that? Yeah, so right now um, we, we are updating our facilities plan and with Minnesota State's process, you go through a 35% where you go through the facilities you have. And then as you finish the process out, you begin to add these conceptual, um, you know, sort of the transformational plans and designs, those sort of the things of what we need. So we're only in year one of this right now. So we don't, we don't have anything planned per se, but it's, it's collecting the facilities and resources we have now and evaluating from there. So we're on year one of our new plan. Did that help or did that make it worse? <laughs> Oh, all of this is inherently a little bit messy. So I think that, I think you're helping. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to clarify here is that when we have some projects that are already entering this conceptual phase, and we know that some of the items that have been suggested here are a little bit more abstract in terms of not actually going toward necessarily a built conceptual um, project that's already beginning that process. Um, if, if we have representatives of Minnesota State Southeast or Winona State, that are able to say, yeah, we anticipate maybe addressing some of those needs, then it seems to make sense to begin to combine them as we look forward to setting priorities here. Yeah, so we have no definitive plans or designs or anything set up yet um, in, our, in, our, in our CFP. 
And in regarding the field house, we have a conceptual program for a field house, uh, but it could definitely be expanded to be more um, with community partners. So we know what WSU's needs are, but we don't have all the community needs mapped out yet. So that would be something very interesting to us. Relatedly, I do want to touch on two elements that did come up, youth and adult athletic space, and then also a need to address ball fields, enhanced ball fields for schools, and that schools was K-12, as well as our higher education institutions. Does anybody who put those ideas forward want to talk about that and whether or not they, they believe that they could be incorporated into one of the two projects we've already begun discussing, or if they could be combined into one and needs to be its own standalone? Uh, WSU needs the ball field in order to do the field house. Yeah, the well, some of that was um, things that I put on there, but I think in whatever we do, we should really capture our E12 um, students, all of our E12 students in the community, and be able to provide resources because they're, you know, as they grow up, they're using our, you know, higher ed. And I would uh, make sure we put St. Mary's in there because it's, I mean, we do have. You know, we're rich in higher ed, but we also have, you know, some really solid E12 programming that can happen. And the more we can combine and collaborate, the better off we are. And ball fields can never have too many. That's from Maynard Johnson. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> This may be a good opportunity for us to bring in city manager Chad Ubel just to provide some additional perspective on the need for overall athletic space in our community. You've been really plugged into that over time. And I, I don't want to lose sight of just saying, oh, we're going to roll this into, for example, the WSU Fieldhouse project because the need might be greater than what one or two sites can provide. So can you provide a little bit of perspective there? That's a lot, but... Uh, at, you know, Jim alluded to it. If we're going to talk about the field house, I mean, the conceptual design is on their current baseball field. Okay, where does the baseball field then go for Winona State? Uh, that baseball field is not just used by Winona State. It's used by K-12 students who in the summer play different activities, summer ball. So to Nancy's point, it's not just, you know, we would label it as that's WSU's ball field. Uh, we certainly see a need for increased field enhancements at you know at Gabrick Park at the lake um, you know um, we have this this larger baseball discussion but I think and you look at Winona if you want to talk just specifically baseball first Luke is that you know here we are community 27,000 we don't have a single youth baseball field in our community except for the two at Lions fields and they're really designated for t-ball like for younger kids uh, the district has youth baseball fields but again no fault of the district or, or Cotter or the school systems they're heavily used for their programming so if, you know I'm in uh, want to go play catch or I want to go play a pickup game it's really hard to get on a field. So that, that's the, the summary of just, you know, specifically like a baseball softball. But you can see where these tie into what I would call the, the overall park enhancements. And that, and that gets into more the, I think there's a slide or someone made a comment about, you know, playground space or indoor play space. Certainly that has a larger connotation, but, and then if you just want to get right to the point, I mean, Obviously, when on a field house, if it goes on the baseball field, then should the community be rediscussing whether or not the relocation of the baseball field should happen at the lake? Should it happen somewhere else in the community? Should it happen at Southeast Tech? I mean, I think that, that that's been, you know, certainly a topic in the past. Definitely. Thank you, Chad. Um, and so for time's sake, um, what we'll do is go to the next slide here and just continue um, with I, talking about some additional projects. Uh, was there a comment? Yeah, can I jump in? Yeah, on, go right ahead. So the, the, on the top three tiered across on the first slide there were things I put in and they're derived from what Engage Winona 
uh, found out uh, in serving 10% of the population, as we saw in the orientation session, housing was the number one concern. And the question was asked uh, and phrased as, you know, uh, what would you, uh, what are your ideas for Winona's future and what issues need to be addressed? Housing was number one. And so I think if this committee does not have a new and affordable accessible housing project in its top five, it's, we're kind of failing uh, as a committee. Uh, and as a city. Uh, the other thing um, in community services that was mentioned is mental health services, addiction services, childcare services. And so I also feel like if we're not doing that, I know that, and I know Jessica might be able to speak to this more, but I know Winona Health closed some of their mental health services a few years ago. I know from students in Winona State's campus, mental health crises are increasingly um, a problem, an issue. And I know that just in the community in general, whether it's because of the pandemic or other factors, mental health is an increasing concern. And so um, I think those should be top priorities just based off of what we learned from our own community members and their needs. Definitely, and that's where um, all that we learned and heard from in that first phase of public engagement is uh, a key to uh, considerations as we move forward uh, with discussing these projects. Thank you, Scott. Um, the next slide here, um, you can see what is on this one. Uh, go ahead, take a look at that, and maybe we can have some discussion on these ones. I'll go ahead and chime in here. Um, the Riverside Hockey Rink one, that's mine. That's a kind of pie in the sky commuter's daydream as I drive along the, the Riverview Boulevard. Um, saw a couple of things on Minnesota Hockey Day at Mankato State and obviously uh, the outdoor, the winter classics. Thought it'd be cool if we had one here. Um, and so the, the location I always envision is um, between Euromalt and the Winona Ambulance Building big open plot of land that would have a nice view of the bluffs and the bridge. I threw that out there just as kind of a crazy idea, but as we're talking more about ball fields, it's kind of got me thinking maybe something like that is potentially possible. And comment back on the, the housing question. Uh, I, I put in the densified student housing for higher ed. Uh, a lot of our land is occupied by, I guess, low density student housing. So densifying student housing could free up space to solve some of the other housing issues. So that's kind of, that's all tied together as one potential solution for housing. Jim, are you okay with us moving that into the affordable accessible housing item? Yes. yes. Perfect. And I would say with, that's also an issue for our students as well at Southeast. So um, <clears throat> anyway, we can help be a part of that solution. Um, that's something we would be highly interested in engaging in. And I'll say one thing too. Um, we This is our seventh uh, meeting of subcommittees and housing has come up again and again and again. So definitely. Um, something that we'll be focusing on uh, throughout, I think the comprehensive plan and in particular on our housing and neighborhood subcommittee. So there is a subcommittee dedicated to that. Uh, and the importance of that work, I think is uh, really coming through with all the comments that we've heard so far. Okay, uh, we're gonna go ahead and move to the third slide. And one question that I had in terms of a maker space, whomever put that up there, um, could you give us a little bit more information on that? I, I understand what the concept of a maker space is. Uh, maybe you could give a little bit of information on that, but um, how that might be tied in uh, to a project or something like that. Well, I wonder if it ties in a bit to arts and culture directly, and maybe it would come up in a different subcommittee, but the way I, see makerspace is it's it's a collaborative space where people can share resources and so cutting down on some of those barriers that 
keep people from making. Um, and uh, I think I've heard bubblings of people being interested in, in having space to create and that collaboration. I'm going to echo that. So I think you're going to see mine is very similar to that on one of the next slides. And I compared it to like a midtown global market. If you've ever been to Minneapolis, you've got stalls. So again, with that overhead piece, they can't afford necessarily to rent out a full, you know, couple thousand square foot downtown for $1,200, but they might afford $500 and they have their stall. And then you have kind of like a central eating place. You also have crafts. I mean, just it's a really welcoming um, creative space and they have live music at the, the market in Minneapolis. So that's um, a model that I was looking at that sounds very similar to what is being shared. Um, Southeast on our Red Wing campus has a maker space. It's more industrial and, you know, sort of workspace for, you know, creating projects and doing technical work, you know, like, you know, welding and carpentry and those kinds of things. And so uh, um, our Red Wing campus does have some experience in that. We haven't expanded that to Winona, but it's one thing that we do, we have done in the past on our other campus. And so one thing that, you know, we're kind of trying to do with this uh, comp plan, as I alluded to before, is just take a step back and look at things from a 30,000 foot perspective. And um, our director of um, community development, uh, Lucy McMartin, noted that what, what this sounds like is a kind of an incubator space, which would be kind of the umbrella term for uh, a maker space uh, that may be for uh, people that are making things or in terms of things that you use, or it could also be an incubator space in terms of uh, people starting out restaurant concepts. Um, so would you be okay with us kind of rephrasing that uh, to an incubator space that maybe for artists, maybe for makers, maybe for restaurateurs? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, and my other idea on here, the um, the city investing in a facility with multiple leasable spaces, I think could fit with that too. So like I've talked with both La Crosse and Eau Claire and they have, um, again, kind of like a tiered rent system where again, when you're starting, it's very low. And then as your business grows, and then I think you at some point max out of the space. So hypothetically, you're established now where you can afford then to pay a, um, a lease or, or buy a building in the area, hypothetically. And whoever sp uh, initially put down retail shopping enhancements in the downtown area, do you want that to be exclusive from this type of conversation or do you want that to be uh, a more broad conversation? Who wants to speak to that? I, I put that on there because along with affordable housing and, oh, sorry. Um, you know, any reason we can bring people into the community um, is helpful. And if, you know, if we have enough housing space um, and also places for them to go and shop and do things, um, we're going to be a more inviting and inclusive community that um, provides, you know, everything you want. So, yes, I think um, combining it would be great. Okay, um, we will move to the next slide. Go ahead and take a look at this one. I have a question. I put on here, to identify neighborhoods and build them according to their identity. And that one seem, it, I'm not sure it fits in here. And so that's my question. Uh, it's not necessarily a physical thing, but it would lead to a physical thing. Um, and I've just seen a lot of uh, opportunity for transformation when there's a very clear identity of, and, and um, uh, kind of segmented neighborhoods. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts on, does it, does it have a home here or not so much? My thought would be it would not have so much of a home here, um, but in our housing and neighborhood subcommittee, definitely. And taking a look at um, different areas of the city that have different identities and being able to um, coalesce around that and what can we do with that? Um, similar to how other cities have kind of branded certain areas of their city um, and the benefits that come along with doing so. 
I have a similar question about uh, bike and walk paths. I've seen quite a few on here, including one of mine. Um, and I'm wondering how that fits in with this subcommittee and possibly the transportation one, and also what might already be planned for that. There's a lot of uh, considerations when it comes to uh, paths like that. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, significant projects, though, um, you know, versus just a connection between one place or another, um, and I'm thinking about things like the um, Riverfront Trail, uh, for instance, which would be a transformative project. Um, another thing could be um, the uh, Bluffs Traverse Trail System. That's a transformative project, um, that type of thing. So things that really have not only impacts beyond people coming in, you know, getting from one place to another, but could serve as a draw to people outside of the city of Winona. If we're taking a look at transportation bike ped related projects in that context, that's where I think it would fit in here. Is that something then that we could combine a few of those and make one of those? I was just going to suggest that. So we have four of them here that I do think could probably be combined. Uh, manufacturing shared use paths between manufacturing producers, basically uh, river walk downtown to the Minnesota Marine Art Museum, trail connections and pedestrian bridges, as well as intercity um, walking and biking paths. So if we, if the committee is comfortable with that, combining those all into one large like um, shared use connector type project would probably be appropriate. We already know the flyway trail connection is mostly complete on the opposite side of the river. The uh, riverfront trail is already a conceptual project, which would actually maybe be the good connector to this group and then feed ideas off of that. If you're comfortable with me combining those into the riverfront trail system, I think that that'd be appropriate. I, I like the idea of the trail being a, a business connector as much as potentially a recreational trail, a way that people and businesses could easily get downtown or to other places to have lunch, to do things before and after work so that they could leave their car park, but get easily around the city doing other things. That, that was a, that one that connected the industries. I really liked that one. I just wanted to add to that too. Part of my thinking on that one was also to, you know, almost uh, maybe manufacturing tourism or, you know, just uh, kind of promotion for those businesses. If they want to have, you know, some sort of visitor center or a small museum that, you know, things like that could be an option as well. Thank you. I had the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, someone talking. I was just going to add, I, you know, the, the bike pass, I think I put it on twice, but the, the reason, um, part of the reason that I think the biking and, and having you know, the trails here are to really help with the safety of getting our, you know, our younger students to school. There's you know, the opportunity to get out to the one on the middle school to the other schools in town. Right now it's pretty dangerous um, for our, you know, anyone to ride a bike and get someplace safely. So however we you know, connect or build trails or you know overpass or whatever it might be to um, enhance that will not only help our families feel safe but our students um, feel safe on their journey to wherever they're going so I'll, i mean i think even our youngest travelers um, will benefit from that sort of a system of connections in town definitely thank you and i think uh, jessica were you about to say something and then i'll go to chris who uh, raised his hand yeah, thank you. I, I have to jump off for two, but I was just going to say I had the train cars idea. I wanted to add something kind of quirky and fun. Um, so that would also draw tourism. So I think people are looking for a novelty experience. So how do you bring people to our community to come explore and then access other things, but then also be useful for, for our own community members. So um, placing decommissioned train cars, I mean, that could be repurposed for um, pop-up cafes, meeting places, even like a, a place to stay overnight. I've seen those across the country in a couple of places I've been. Um, so yeah, a little quirky and, and different, but I thought something that could be unique that could bring people to the area for a novelty type experience. Thank you. And Chris? I just wanted to echo about getting students safely. You know, we sit at 
you know, the corner of 43 and 61, sort of in a, a little island over there and getting across the highway is an issue for some of our students who do walk and uh, the businesses on that side and the, the housing going that way. So um, if there's a bike path that could connect us over to the lake, then increase our accessibility, that would be good for us and everyone over on our little island. Wonderful, thank you. And Jerome. Yeah, I got it. There we go. I think that these, uh, uh, a number of uh, suggestions for um, pedestrian bike paths uh, really all point to uh, a component of what would eventually become uh, what we could call an auto optional city where it's not necessary to have a car to get anywhere and we might want to look at this as a component of of, of that sort of a long-range concept definitely and in our uh, transportation subcommittee the focus is on multimodal transportation so the ability to do and get around using multiple different modes of transportation. Um, but um, we definitely heard it loud, loud and clear um, from you all. And so we think that this kind of connections type idea um, for um, different amenities in different places you need to go or want to go uh, is a project that seems like uh, something we might wanna talk about. So with that, we'll move to the last slide. Um, and talk about uh, daycare opportunities that are mo mobile and accessible. Um, definitely an economic development uh, consideration as well as just a family uh, consideration, being able to um, have uh, childcare for your little um, while you are uh, going to work um, is very important for the uh, future of our community. I don't know who put that forward. Um, obviously it is critical as Carlos was outlining. Is this daycare opportunities that are mobile and accessible explicitly different than more daycare centers or more daycare facilities, which was also on another slide. I, I would like to combine them if possible, but if this is a specific concept, this mobile daycare concept that I've never heard of, um, I, would love, I would like to learn more about it and include it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll look at uh, combining that with uh, what we had discussed prior. All right, thank you everybody for the wonderful discussion. Um, and I think uh, Luke has made some progress on our next slides, which will actually be voting on um, the projects. And how many slides uh, do you have, Luke? All right, everybody, we started off with about 37 different ideas and we've tailored them down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, approximately 21. Uh, and that's off the cuff math. So don't trust me 100% on that. I would like us to take a, take a look at these. We're going to go into a mentee and have and pull all of you. Some of them aren't in the perfect order that they were submitted. They're kind of more in the order that we talked about them. And we are going to be asking you to be picking your top three. And the idea is that we will get a disbursement of votes here that will create the ability to begin to select those priorities so that when we meet again in a few weeks, we won't have to just come back and replicate this process once again. No, yes. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, there's, there's one thing here that was on your list that didn't end up on anybody else's list or end, end up on the screen. And I think that we really admit it a miss at not giving it proper consideration. Um, I didn't mention it because I figured everybody else would. Um, but it's the police fire community center issue. I think that that's really going to be dominant in the community, something that really is important and that we better get up there. We have room to add it, so it was added. Okay, 
Um, so what I'll do in just one moment here is put uh, another Menti uh, poll up on the screen. And what you'll see is that there are 10 options on this first slide. You'll have three votes per person um, to uh, vote on which one that you'd like to see. Then we'll go to the next slide. And again, you'll have three votes. Luke and I will tabulate all of them cumulatively and then um, based on that, we'll see which projects um, are the most uh, popular. And if we have to do a kind of like a tiebreaker, uh, we'll do that as well. So here we go. Um, and just give me one second to bring it up online for everybody. The code for those who might be interested is going to be 45307842. And it's now on the screen in front of you. We can we can leave this open um, beyond this meeting. What we want to do before we end up at the next meeting is to make sure that we have results for you so we can keep it open for a few days. Put the one minute notification on there. Okay, thank you everyone. We will move on to the next slide. <laughs> we did a dry one earlier and everything was looking good. <laughs> we call it a dotocracy, dotmocracy. Everybody's in the same room, but when it's virtual too, it's how do you. I put the one minute on there.
Okay, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. And last but not least. Okay, I put the one minute up on this last one. Okay, thank you, everybody. And uh, we do have a top nine projects. And so what we'll do is while Luke is um, creating the last slide, we'll have the final vote in just a few minutes here. Um, what I'd like to do is try and schedule uh, our next meeting um, before we finish up here today. And so if you could all, um, I don't know if we can take a look at your calendars uh, and go away from the menti for the time being. Seems like this one to two uh, time frame is working good for quite a few people. Um, go ahead and it doesn't work good for you, Ethan. It does not. Okay. I can make it work if I have to, but it does not work well. Okay. Um, something later, like three or four is significantly better for me. Okay. Anybody else, uh, three or four um, would work better for you in the afternoon a little bit later on? Go ahead and speak now or forever hold your peace. What was that, Jim? I'm sorry. Okay. So what we'll, we'd be looking at doing then is having a meeting towards the end of the month um, and in terms of May, um, how does the 31st, it's a Tuesday afternoon, uh, look for people between, uh, we'll just say, how about a four o'clock? Doesn't work for me. Okay. Uh, if we backed it up to three o'clock, would that work? Different day, okay. Yeah. Sure. The week before might be better. At least for me. Okay. So on uh, the 26th, we do have a, a conflict with another subcommittee um, at four o'clock. Uh, three o'clock might be cutting it a little bit too close for staff. Um, okay. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, 
How about June 2nd at four o'clock? So that's a Thursday, June 2nd at four o'clock. Okay. Same, three o'clock? Okay. <laughs> Zoom. Can we look at the 25th of May? is also another one that's popular for other subcommittees. How about um, taking a So as we look at this, um, we're kind of landing in that week of the 23rd type time frame. Um, does anybody have conflicts earlier in the day that we should be aware of right now? say on Wednesday the 25th, would something around one o'clock or two o'clock work for people here? Sure. All right, let's go ahead and pencil it in for Wednesday the 25th and we'll split the difference and say 1.30 p.m. And we will send out a placeholder meeting right after this meeting. So you will all have that on your calendars as soon as possible. 130 to 3 would be great. Wednesday the 25th. Wednesday the 25th, correct. All right, and we can now return to our mentee. Carlos is pulling that back up and we have one last slide for you. These are the nine highest rated from those three different previous slides. I did not include the previous votes. So we would just wanna take a fresh look here and see what else you guys are interested in. And keep in mind that while we are looking for kind of a top five to really flesh out in the plan, we will be addressing as many of these as we can through the next few months. All fields and yeah yeah so the question the question from lydia is does the wsu field house in this iteration in, include that additional indoor space for winter and other athletic um, field or ball field opportunities and yes it would uh, the goal of this committee of course is to make sure that those types of considerations do get included in the plan so please be aware that while we are looking at very much a high level look at these potential ideas um, the actual individual detail is going to be robust. I believe you are. I'm sorry, you guys. All right, we started the one minute countdown, but I believe that this is everybody here. Uh, we do have clearly a split vote in that third ranking, um, but that gets us to five pretty decisively for the incubator maker space slash market, a riverfront connector trail system, the youth and adult and school athletic space, WSU field house and affordable and accessible housing. So with that, everybody, unless there's any comments or questions, um, what we intend to do is to really bring this all together into a bit more of a document, send it out to all of you again, make sure that you are all aware of that, and then begin planning for this process, working our way through each of these items. Any closing comments from the group? 
hearing none we will see all of you on the 25th or on the 25th at 1 30 p.m thank you very much for your time this was a, a big first day appreciate it